you all know me, pretty much all of you, uh, and that I lived here until 2018 and then left to go back to Plattsburgh. Why, I don't know. <laughs> they asked me where I was going this, this, this week, and I said, I'm heading south. <laughs> where it's warm. Where's that? Syracuse. <laughs> oh. uh, with me are Kathy Bournou and Tom Dyer, and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. I think everybody pretty much knows me, Kathy Bournou, and I, I do have an affiliation with Plattsburgh where he's working, and I went there. And when I graduated, I got a job in Vernon, Verona, Cheryl School District, wherever the heck that was. <laughs> And Don Everhart interviewed me and he offered me the job and said, I want you to start in two weeks. And I said, I don't even know where I am. I have to find a place to live. And he said, oh, that's easy. We'll get you a room at the mansion house. And I said, what's the mansion house? <laughs> well, I got a room at the mansion house and I learned very quickly what it was all about. I have to tell you briefly, I was teaching first grade. I was in the teacher's room and I heard somebody talking about all the noise. And I said, what noise? This is the quietest place I've ever lived. <laughs> I had no idea at that time. I was still pretty new. And a Y-E-S was different than an O-I-S-E. <laughs> so uh, years later, after many years in education and raising six boys with my <laughs> wonderful husband, who I met, who worked for Unlimited, um, limited, and um, I wanted to give back to the mansion house. And so I did training to become a docent and one thing led to another and I'm involved with this. And my cohort in crime, Linda Evans, is not here tonight. <coughs> she has been very active in this, very, very active, but she had theater tickets. So she sends her best and uh, many of you have already spoken with her. Uh, and I'm Tom Geiler. I'm the Director of Museum Affairs at the Oneida Community Mansion House. Um, I guess my job is to do something with all these interviews. So you'll hear um, about what we're doing with them and how they're helping us under to understand more about an unlimited and about the original Atlanta community. But uh, I've been here about 18 months now, I think. Um, so lots of stuff going on. I'm really excited to talk to you all about all the exciting stuff going on at the Mansion House and um, how uh, United Limited plays a big role there. So. Just a, a note. Kathy graduated from SUNY Plattsburgh with a degree in elementary education. That's probably the best program in the system. Happened to be one that where I worked. So, you can, so, you can so it's sure. not prejudice for anything. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so next presentation really is a summary of what we've been doing, why we're doing it, where we are with it, and then some uh, some stories that we've collected that uh, you might find interesting, if not humorous. <laughs> so it is a, a, a legacy project. <clears throat> Oneida Limited is uh, connected to Oneida community in that a lot of the values and uh, procedures that the community used were also uh, used in the company when it got going and then continued for about three generations. And that makes sense because the people who really got the company going, the silverware part of it, were all uh, community members or, dissent, or uh, yeah, community members. Here's what we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> collecting personal narrative. This is the academic part of the presentation. Collecting uh, personal narratives, they're called, when you do an oral history. Stories about working at OL. We figured, um, oh, the narratives are edited, and then I send them to an AI uh, outlet that transcribes them, but then I have to edit them severely. For some reason, AI doesn't recognize Oneida Limited <laughs> when they hear it. They say, a night limit. <laughs> so, anyway, a whole bunch of, so I edit those. Uh, I also edit the, the narratives for uh, verbal tics, uh, uh, some content. There haven't been too many four-letter words used, but <laughs> you know, some of them have been a little 
spicy. So I sort of edit those out because these are going to be heard by a whole bunch of people. They will represent basically what the personal journals and the records from the old community represent. That is uh, a record of what uh, what it was like to work for a woman, as we understand from those personal journals, diaries, what it was like to live in the Oman community. Uh, one of the things I want to do eventually, if I live long enough, is to do something similar with Cheryl. What was it like to grow up in Cheryl? Um, and this is a project that's been uh, approved, sponsored by, mm -hmm. sort of sponsored by the United Community Mansion House Board of Trustees. Uh, I was very mm -hmm. careful to develop a proposal and get their permission to do this. And those of you who have participated know that there are all kinds of forms which we <clears throat> talk about. These are the key people that are doing the project, uh, co-coordinators and interviewers. Um, Eric Kimball is the guy who works in the basement of the sales office for another silverware company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot the name of it. He had a box of pictures, some of which you'll see, that he bought at, at a, an antique store in Baltimore for a hundred bucks. There must have been 500 photographs in there from the old company. <clears throat> I think it was Jim Demarest who, when he was interviewed, said that the company had files of photographs <coughs> from, uh, from when the company had been operated over the years. And they were all mostly all thrown away <coughs> when the bankruptcy occurred. So, but we, we have some of them. Uh, so Eric was was really invaluable in doing in helping with this project. David Kiner, you might recognize that name. His father and, and uncle worked for the company for a lot of years. Uh, and he did too in, in sales, traveling sales. He did a dissertation looking at the culture of one island in it. That is, he interviewed a number of people who worked there, uh, including my father, and got them to talk about what it was like to work there. This whole thing started because Kate Whalen Smith had the idea that we, maybe we ought to collect some of these narratives. She had seen from, uh, from the web a similar project done at Keene Valley Library up where I'm, where I'm living. Uh, they have a project called Adirondack Voices. And it's really kind of cool if you go to the website for Keene Valley Library, they show pictures of the Adirondacks and then have a, a narrator, a personal narrative over the, over the picture, um, talking about what it was like living there. I had to mention my sister, my older sister, my bossy older sister. <laughs> uh, she lives in Chicago and she helped me develop the proposal. It's kind of funny. I, in my career, I was uh, an educational researcher. You know, I did those studies where I compared groups of kids and which, which method of teaching is better and all that stuff. And I thought, well, this is a project where we have to prove something. <clears throat> well, no. We don't have to prove anything. Uh, we just want to collect people's stories, reminiscences about working there. And Steve Hill is my son who helped with some of the slides. <laughs> These are the five top reasons for doing this project. <clears throat> uh, quite frankly, in retirement, I was bored to tears. I retired three times. And I'm thinking of applying for a couple jobs. <laughs> uh, but I, again, I've mentioned that I've had some time on my hands. And Kate Whalen Smith and Chris O'Neill, the executive director of the Mansion House, said, uh, Hey, we got a project for you. So, oh, great. So then I talked to Kathy and Linda Evans and got the whole thing going. Kathy, the next one's yours. Okay, so I did become a docent. And uh, every time I give a tour, I go, 
That's a really good question. I'll try and find the answer because I, you know, there's so much to know about the mansion house and the community and what happened when the community formed Oneida Limited and what happened when it broke up. They always want to know. And then what's the rest of the story? So um, I'm always looking for new information and we share with, you know, the dose and share it with one another. Tom holds meetings once a month, which is great. We can share ideas and updates, but um, this, this is a great help to, uh, to us to find out what was going on with Oneida Limited, what it was like, how they continued to have the values, the company continued to have the values of the original community. Tom? Huh? Sure, yeah. So I think one of the things that we're working on at the Mansion House is um, to expand the narrative of, of the timeline. Um, you know, the, the story doesn't end in 1881 when the community uh, disbands to form Oneida Community Limited. Um, and we want to extend it as right now the, the story goes more or less into the 1960s, 1970s at the, um, at the latest, but we want to expand the timeline um, to, to include the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, to talk about what happened to Oneida Limited, why it declined, why it ultimately went bankrupt. Um, we also want to talk about, you know, talk about why those things happened, but also talk about the legacy of Oneida Limited, because everything we have here in Cheryl and the Kenwood area and Oneida writ large is really because of Oneida Limited, right? Um, so thinking about that, that legacy as well. Um, also in how Oneida Limited was instrumental uh, along with a number of descendants in <laughs> divesting it from the Mansion House for Oneida Limited, um, so that now the Mansion House can be a nonprofit to tell your story. And we want to more intentionally um, collect your stories, just in the same way we collect objects. We brought a nice uh, display of objects back there. We do collect those things, um, but we also collect stories. And the best part about stories is they don't take up a lot of room, right? They're really big objects, but it's really just a file. It's not, it's not a giant uh, die that we have to create floor space for so it doesn't crack the floors. Um, so we actually, we think about it as collective. It's a new collection at the Mansion House. Um, and we want to mention that we really, we, we, we know this and we, we try to, to purposely do this. We want other people to know that the Mansion House is a repository for the Oneida Limited story. Um, Emily's back there and we can talk about this you know, after the lecture and see some of these objects. We have a lot of really cool things um, that the Mansion House is collected. Um, and we want to make sure that those things are preserved. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things is people say, oh, that's not that old. Well, it's like, yeah, but it may not be that old, but it will be in 50 years when people are coming here and asking about what was it like to work at a night limit, what kind of things did they produce, why was it special? Um, and that legacy for us is important because part of our mission is to tell the story of the United community and its legacy. And Oneida Limited is its legacy. Cheryl today is its legacy. So, um, that's what I've got. Kathy, I think it's back to you. Yeah. So as Dave mentioned, we, you know, we have the narratives of life in the community. There have been many books written in my father's house, Dupont Moyes talking about growing up here and all of that. But we didn't have it from the people who've been working there. And when we started this out, Linda and I brainstormed, who do we know? And between the two of us, I mean, Linda grew up in Cheryl, so she knows everybody. <clears throat> but, you know, who do we know and who can we approach about working at Oneida Limited? Who am I able to be interviewed? I can't tell you how many people said, oh, I was just, uh, you want to talk to the, the monkey monks. <laughs> no, if the people in the factory weren't doing the work that they were doing, there would be no company. And I wanted to get across to people that every single person's job was important. And so we're still working on this. We're still doing interviews. So if you haven't been interviewed or you know somebody who would like to be interviewed or you'd like to encourage them, let us know. Uh, I had an idea knowing some of the people that worked at, for the company in, in my generation that the stories would be interesting, if not funny. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that's, for those of us who didn't work there and are curious about it, this, this provides a way to learn what it was like. Uh, I did apply for a job and I'm not gonna tell you I was rejected. 
Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> My timing is really bad. <laughs> Just before John Marcellus did a whole bunch of cuts. So it, it wasn't going to work for me. And it's probably a good set. Because I, I'm not sure I worked it. And uh, Dwayne's not sure I worked it either. Do <laughs> um, you have any comments about that, too? Oh, you had to live with somebody who worked there. I, I did. I happily, happily. But, oh, you know, okay. <laughs> there, there were times, you know, I mean, let's face it, any job there are the days that are good days and the days that are not so good. And uh, the not so good days, you know, I was there to hold him up. And when I had a not so good day at work, he held me up. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, I think just as someone who didn't grow up here or knew most of what they knew from about the original community, it's been really interesting to think about local history like this. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really added really a new layer to what we do at the museum. So um, it's been it's been a pleasure to listen to the stories and see what themes emerge. And um, I'll talk to you about more in the later in the presentation, sort of how that's coming to physical form uh, at the Mansion House in the spring. Okay. Okay. Kathy's going to talk a little bit about our procedure and forms and stuff. Let's give a brief overview of how we did this. So there were, again, many iterations, thanks to Dave's family helping out with, you know, making sure that we had this so that people were comfortable, they knew what they were getting into, that they had the ability to be anonymous, to listen to the recording after if they wanted anything taken out or they didn't want it public. Um, and to make sure that they understood what was being asked of them. So they could stop at any time um, during the interview. Um, we can choose to take part of it out or we might edit part of it out if you were swearing a lot. Um, <laughs> but also you could uh, use, this could be used for research purposes or for anything that Tom would come up with with an Oneida exhibit. Um, so that was, that was the consent form. And we put it on the website and we also made it available um, a PDF format that could be printed, but made it, tried to make it convenient for people to just sign up on the website. And we also let people know, here's basic outline of what we're going to ask. Did your job responsibilities change over the time you worked for another limited? Or, and first of all, how did you get your job? Um, what are some of the aspects of working for an idol limited that you think are important for people to know about? Is there anything that you think made the company unique as an employer? And can you give some examples from your daily work schedule? So that gave a format you could think about it before you came in to talk. And we did it either Zoom, because we were still in COVID time, and we could do it on Zoom, or we could do it in person. We came up with, um, they came up with equipment that um, we would just talk and it would record into this tiny little chip and it's magic. It's magic. I don't even begin to understand it, but it works. Mm -hmm. And um, usually it would take 30 to 60 minutes depending on how chatty people were. So we had a few inter other interviewers, uh, Kelly, um, Kelly Rose was one and Susan Velasco. And Linda and I have done most of them um, and will continue to do so. Um, when they had the form returned and everything, we set up a time and place. Um, usually we would do the in-person ones at the mansion house, but um, one woman was very, um, she had a cane and she was very infirm and she didn't do stairs well. So I met with her at the Oneida Library which has very easy access and I, they have um, a recording room and I brought our equipment in there and I recorded it there. So, you know, we try and meet people where they are and make it as easy as possible for them. Kathy? Yes. Did you ever have anybody that gave an interview that said they didn't want it published till after they died? No. <laughs> Just wondering. No, but so that's possible though. Question. That is that's possible, you could do that. I mean, I know there were people who said, to, my, to Linda, my sister, that she told me that uh, they were talking and they say, you know what, I don't really want to do this. I, I, I know too many people in town or 
something like that. Yep. Things they had said they thought were going to upset somebody, so they just halfway through it, they just they kind of bailed. And, yeah. 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 Was, I was just wondering. There was one guy who wanted to be anonymous. When I edited that recording, mentioned his name. <laughs> 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 I edited that out, but then. Kelly Rose did that interview. By the end, Kelly said, uh, he said, ah, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. So, so far, we um, interviewed 27 employees, former employees, seven women, 20 men. Um, interesting that 11 of the former employees had a family member who worked at United Limited, and most often it was the father. It was a generational thing. Uh, four others knew someone who worked in the United Limited who then introduced them to personnel, and four were descendants of the original community. Did that surprise you at all? That, that what? The, were, the description of the group? Um, no, I mean, they weren't as many women um, working in the factory, although they were, as yeah, we'll hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, just getting in touch with people, getting the word out has been harder than we expected. How did you do that? How did you look for people? Well, like I said, Linda and I brainstormed oh, a lot of, of that. And then we got in touch with some of the people and said, who do you know? Uh, we had it at, we had a little blurb in the, in the newspaper. Um, we have it on the website. Um, and we're open to suggestions for other ways to reach out. Yeah, the, the Rome Sentinel uh, covered the presentation we did in a model library and that generated a couple too. Right. Yeah, the best the best ambassadors of the program are the people that have already been interviewed. Mm -hmm. So they can tell them this is really what it was like. You know, we're not there's no secret agenda. It's not scary. It's just mm -hmm. it's just talking, it's just having a conversation. So that, yeah. I think that's that's a, the best part about oral history project is the more people we get to participate, the more it get, it gathers momentum. So and the more we're actually like we, you could we're happy to talk, but there are um, divisions and areas of the company we would love to have that we don't have represented. So, it'd be great. What uh, what we've heard are uh, examples of Oneida community and Oneida limited traditions, and a couple of them are listed here. Uh, one person being interviewed in particular said. We, we do people before profits. Said management works for two groups, employees first and the stockholders second. That was true for a while, most of the time. Uh, certainly innovation was a tradition, lifelong learning. Uh, several people talked mm -hmm. about being sent by the company to uh, take courses and, and uh, Updates some skills that they had. Um, almost everybody talked about what a great feeling of community and family there was working in the, with a particular group that they worked with. And of course, there's quality. Uh, a handful of the, the people we interviewed said, I wanted to work for Oneida Limited because I, I knew the quality was good. And we could be proud of that. So we have some uh, selected anecdotes and stories. Names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that they talked about was the caring, the caring uh, of the employees. And this interview says, when I first came here, <clears throat> My wife and I moved from, up from New Jersey, and they took an interest in making sure that we were happy, introduced us to lots of people. They had a lot of clubs, too, that you could join. I got involved in the gymnasium and then also the archery club, which at one time had 60 members that was located behind the knife plant. It was like playing golf. And then in the wintertime, we'd shoot in the CAC gymnasium. Another big part of the company, too, was the retirement parties. They were big. People look forward to those because I used to photograph the retirement party and the award ceremonies. And we always had those here at the mansion house. And there were a lot of people. 
So yeah, there were a lot of things to be involved in those things for retirees at the CAC clubhouse. They had their own clubs. The company was real good to employees. And my thing was that when my wife got sick, they took care of everything. They assigned me to Jack Stone. Jack helped me with all the insurance because the company was self-insured at that time. They took care of all her medical expenses and everything. So, you know, I have nothing but good things to say about what the company did. And even John Marcellus, <laughs> you know, it was near the end, but he said, if you need to take the plane to go to the Mayo Clinic, just let me know. Never came to that, but yeah, the company was real good at that time. <clears throat> I have three little vignettes here. Uh, salesmen would, would come in and these people would say, where are all the fences and stuff? And I tell people, well, you must be from California because California has fences between all those houses. The company would put them up at the mansion house and they'd ask, what's the mansion house like? And I'd say, you could, you could leave your door open. You know, you could go outside for a walk. You didn't have to lock your door. Matter of fact, when you come back to your room, you might see something in your room that's been moved, straightened out, not by a housemaid or anything. There was a man at the mansion house, Lenny, who would, who would go around. He'd open your door. If the heat was too high, he'd turn it down. If the door was open, he'd close it. <laughs> I knew that guy. <laughs> this was a, a, the next one is kind of a funny story, I thought, and it's been verified that this actually happened. The bowling alleys were in the cellar to start with, and then they moved them upstairs, which was an old cow barn in its day that was kind of set up for factory workers. The golf course was set up for the office people, but they still had an office league on Friday nights. Generally, all the leagues were the mill rats. I can remember they used to have the salesmen coming in once a year, wine and dine them, clam bakes, the whole big thing. One year, they had it over in the clubhouse. They had the upper echelon salesmen in the gym, and the mill rat people were bowling. Two of them had a, few of them had a hard time with that and said, well, I'm going to get some clams. I'm going in the gym. I work for the company too. Why are they getting it? And we're not. So a few of them went in there, busted the party up and had some clams. The next day, you now the clams were bad. Everybody got sick. <laughs> had to go to the hospital to get hemoglobin shots. So that was one of the last meetings that they had with the factory workers and the salesmen and the upper echelons were together. <laughs> True. Yeah. And, and the final, the third one is, so I can remember back in the early 80s, they'd go in, they'd sit in the sauna, and that's when the co-ed stuff started. And these two guys were in there with towels around them, and a woman walked in there and, and caught them. I mean, they were all shriveled up like a prune anyways, <laughs> and they were getting ready to get out. But they didn't dare get up and get out because, you know, they were up in their 70s. <laughs> they were both caught right there with the woman. Old school, couldn't get up. They had to wait until she ran through her 15 minutes in there. It was pretty funny because they come running looking for me saying, what's going on with women coming into the sauna room? And that's how it goes, you know, it, that's when it started to be cool. <laughs> All righty. So, Oneida Limited is a place that I always wanted to work. I've always loved silver there. I worked at the night plant. I wasn't special in anything. I was special in everything. Everything I learned, I tried to learn to be good at it. For the heck of it, I applied to work for the hammer room. My husband worked there, and I went in and watched, and I thought, oh, I can do that. It looked interesting. Well, I was told that I had to wait because they had to hire. They hired a couple of new people off the streets, and they were going to be put in there before me. Well, I didn't like that. So I was working one night on the end of the furnace I was inspecting. 
This little old guy comes in off the street. You could smell the booze on him. And he's really friendly and made me think of my grandfather. I started talking to him and I was telling him that they hired guys off the street before they made you work in there. Oh, he was a wonderful man. He just listened to me and smiled and talked to me. When he left, the girl in the other furnace looked at me in shock and she goes, do you know who that was? I said, oh, some drunk come off the street to talk to us. She goes, that was noise. The very next day, my boss comes to me and, and he said, you start Monday in the hammer room. <laughs> <laughs> they were an equal employment place. Maybe there were a few people that came there that couldn't make it, but you know, they probably were better off being cooks or something. <laughs> Everybody has a thing that they can do. Oneida Limited was, it was different. To me, it was like when you went in there, it was like you felt you were part of that family. It was one big family and you became a part of it. I didn't think I could work in the factory for 40 years. I made an immediate plan after high school to get enough money to get my butt into college. I worked from actually about September right until Christmas, and that year they had a layoff around Christmas time. I don't know how long it lasted because at that point I had jumped ship. I went to college at that point in time, but I left on good graces. But I, when I had to hire me back every summer, after I graduated college with a journalism degree out of Oneonta State, I ended up coming back to Oneida and they rehired me. And lo and behold, they put me behind the same damn machine. Oh, sorry, it doesn't, say, it doesn't say damn. Same machine that I've run those four summers. Usually it was a buffy machine. <clears throat> so, well, three of the four summers, one summer I had a motorcycle accident, busted up my wrist. And they put me in return goods, which was a great job. But I told you that they hired from within, and they hired from within for a reason. They wanted you to know the process of this product so you could speak intelligently about it. But you could also have the feeling that you know you were part of the team. And it worked. We were all very proud of the product we had built and made. So I applied for 17 different jobs after I'd gotten out of college. I always seemed not to hit the mark. And finally, one afternoon, we had quite a shouting match in the HR office. Finally, after that, I got a job around working as an assistant, going on the road with trade shows. I had that job for about a year. Then I got promoted to be what they call a production man in the advertising department, which was a great job. And you know, that worked great for about four years until computers came in. And a lot of those middle jobs that we performed by hand were eliminated by computers. I got moved kind of laterally back into the trade shows, which I ended up doing for another 20 years, 20 years on the road. My last nine years for the company were at the factory store. It's funny how jobs come to you. I knew a lot of people. I knew the product line from the shows that I went to. I was sent to the company store as an assistant manager. They sent me over there and we had 10 full-time and 20 part-time people. And the first speech that I gave them was that I did not come from retail. We had some people who did and I said, I'll listen to anybody who has an idea that they wanna give me. My job is not to mess up. You guys have been running this store be long before I got here. Don't let me make decisions that are bad for Oneida <clears throat> or bad for you or me. I worked with the nicest people, team of people. I used to tell stories about the sales promotion crew, the nicest team of people that I ever worked with. And when I got transferred and left that team, I thought I'm never gonna have a team of people like that. But the team at the factory store was just as great. All right, and now we move into um, Oneida 2.0, um, Liberty Tabletop, which is part of the story. And we were able to interview both Matt Roberts and um, Greg um, Owens. Owens. I was gonna say Olson, and I knew that was right. Greg Owens, thank you. So Dave and I are gonna share their story. Yeah. 
Greg Owens and Matt Roberts were both working in Mexico as expats. They had knowledge of sales, operations, and the marketing <clears throat> business for their respective companies. They began with a blank piece of paper and had the idea to buy Oneida Limited while using a different production model. After a two and a half year period and filing their own chapter 11 reorganization, they realized they needed a completely new business model. It was basic flatware math. Big name department stores were buying a box of silverware for 30 bucks, selling it for a hundred and when it cost $40 to make. What if we could sell it for a hundred dollars? The new owners thought. They couldn't open their own store, so they used Amazon and started a website called Liberty Tabletop. No one knew they were there, so they tried using Google AdWords uh, and pay-per-click advertising. They made the only flatware totally made in the USA. Greg put down $20, got 20 clicks, and two orders for $150 each, and they were on their way. That's pretty much how the business is still done today. Flatware production was brought back from Mex the Mexico plant to the Sherrill facility called Sherrill Manufacturing. 60% of the business last year was e-commerce web business through Liberty Tabletop. Only a small percentage of people looked for mm -hmm. things made in America. So they used influencers to keep the business growing. An early influencer idea from an employee was making flatware with smiling skulls on the handle. I've got a picture up here. Um, thinking the guys with this idea needed a drug test and were out of their minds, <laughs> the new owners nevertheless told the employees to carve out a design of happy skulls. Long and short of it, the company ran out of supply three times on pre-order sales before the first, first box was shipped. A niche market was born of zombies, motorcycle riders, and tattoo artists. <laughs> Sales of the skull pattern soared and it has become the best selling product line to date. Other niche markets included Woodstock patterns. Uh, those are my people. <laughs> Harbor Motifs, uh, American Garden, American Outdoors, <laughs> Earth Holidays, and Honeybees among many other new dinnerware patterns. The company began offering other tabletop items made in America, business increased. Knives made by Cutco and silverware chests made by the Mennonites, <clears throat> among other items can be found on links on their website. But when the pandemic hit, the owners did not know what to expect. But with people working and cooking at home, business actually doubled for about two and a half years. Things are tapering off now, so the company is looking for the next great idea to keep the business growing. The factory to table model has eliminated the middleman and all new product is shipped to the customer right from the factory floor. All the manufacturing supplies are USA made and as local as possible. Shipping boxes are made in Eaton, New York. The steel is from Pittsburgh. The electric power, of course, comes from Cheryl. The cleanest electricity is used to run the facility and consumers know what metals are in the steel. The tagline, there's no mystery metal in Liberty Tabletop has moved the company to the forefront of the Made in America movement. Original machines from Oneida Limited have been upgraded with technology and the first robot will soon be put in place that will forge the knives used and using an induction heater. The 73 employees enjoy a four day 40 hour work week, but can be called upon to work weekends when demand is high. Greg and Matt want the company to be people driven, not dollar driven. They know every worker and their family and are seen daily on the factory floor just as the leaders were in the 19th and 20th centuries of Oneida Limited. Moving into the 21st century with the well being of their workers in mind will enable Cheryl Manufacturing to continue the legacy that began with the Oneida community in the 1800s. Tom's gonna to talk about next steps. Can I see the clicker bit? Yeah. Um, so what we did last, um, last summer um, with the help of a uh, Colgate Upstate Institute intern named Stuart Sopko, is we listened to all the uh, clips, all the, the, the interviews and 
surveyed the Mansion House collection and created an exhibit uh, called More Than a Silverware Company, which is uh, the Oneida Limited story. And um, this was a, a small exhibit we put on at the Madison County, County Courthouse that was up from about the early August till about the middle of January. Um, and I'll walk you through that a little bit here. Basically everything that was in that exhibit is back on that table back there. We just sort of repurposed it for this in case you missed it. But we really focused on four themes. We focused on innovation, as Dave said, um, both innovation in terms of the quality, and we use the didactic from how it goes to a, from a blank uh, all the way to a finished spoon, um, but also about um, thinking about the advertising, which was just as important. Uh, so thinking about um, the way they had innovative ad techniques, like you know, you send in a, a postcard with a quarter, you get a five-piece set, things like that um, that were there. <clears throat> and one of the quotes we had from that one um, said that we didn't buy equipment. We wouldn't need someone to stamp our flatware. We designed it and built it ourselves. So thinking about how you know they may have bought stock machinery, but it was not just used that way. It was always altered in different ways to, to meet the Oneida uh, vision. We also said community. And this one focused uh, largely on um, the Cheryl community and the benefits that were not monetary um, at, the, at the company. So uh, we have a map of Lewis Point um, where people would go uh, and relax over the summer. Uh, the CAC bowling alley, you heard about the leagues already, um, as well as the Oneida Silversmith newsletter. We have plenty of those to think about what life was like in the 80s and 90s here and the amazing things that, that happened uh, in this community. Um, and we also were thinking about uh, one of the interviews said, and there were so many people that lived in Cheryl that worked right there. It was almost like the neighborhood company. So much of it was so intertwined with Atlanta Limited, and it was a very unique thing. We also talked about tradition. This is something we're thinking a lot about at the Mansion House. What is the through line? What are the themes that go from the original 19th century United community all the way through uh, to Oneida Limited? And here we talk a lot about tradition. Um, of silver making that dates back to the 19th century, uh, a brand that did talk about at times uh, the history of the community, but also so the many generations of people that work there. Um, and one person said, you know, it wasn't just one person from one family that worked there. It was husbands and wives and aunts and uncles. And, you know, people that had been divorced, people got married, families were there. What a family company it was that was tra uh, passed down to generations. And then finally, we have OCQ, or United Community Quality. Um, and there's not super much interpretation on this. It's just sort of showcasing all the different kinds of patterns and forms that United Limited made throughout the 20th century. And the pride that people took in their work and the high quality that was produced. And we had one, folk, uh, one person who worked there say, you know, the one thing about United Limited is our quality of our product was exceptional. There wasn't anyone who'd meet our quality standard. We were the top dogs. And the plan is, um, this spring, with the help of uh, folks in Rotary and, and other people, we're going to reinstall this exhibit with more things um, at the Mansion House. Um, we're on the first floor. Um, we're going to keep these four themes. We're going to add two more. Uh, one is tentatively titled Losing Its Luster, which is going to talk about sort of the darker times, the, the end of, of Oneida Limited, and why that was. We're looking for people to talk about that because you all lived it, right? Um, there's only been one real book written about it at this point, uh, but we need to know, you know, so because everyone has a different story about why things happen the way they do. And then finally, we're going to talk about um, uh, a lasting legacy, basically, kind of the things I was saying earlier today, of, you know, the Mansion House being a place for, for your stories and why Cheryl looks the way it does today is largely because of Odina Limit and everything it did for the community. Um, so we do that, but we also have two sort of exciting new things going on. It won't be sort of your typical museum exhibit. One will be a, uh, we'll have a table setting. Uh, as we've gone through the Mansion House collection, um, we found we have a lot of duplicates of flatware, surprisingly enough, right? There's, you know, we have 55 Michael I suppose, um, <laughs> at least. Um, but thinking about, we can use those things in new ways. We can have people set the table, right? And kind of look at all the different patterns and, and set the table in different ways using sort of uh, magazines and things of the time. And then the last thing we're gonna do, which is really exciting, is we're gonna make it, instead of just reading, like sort of printing out quote cards, we're gonna have a, an audio uh, system in the room where you can click on with an iPad, click on different stories and listen to those people and see some pictures because we've had tons of pictures and things. Um, and we'd also invite you that if you have unique things from Unlimited that you think should be uh, saved for future generations, for researchers, for exhibits, 
please get in contact with us because we'd love to see some things. We've got a lot of spoons and things, but it's the, you know, it's the pins and photographs we may not have seen that they're really important as well. Um, I do have a video to show, but I think it's gonna be hard for the folks on Zoom. So we'll do that at the end. Um, but for our folks on Zoom uh, who are watching this recorded, on this page, on this YouTube page, you can find this video. So um, next steps. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> I don't think it put a slide. Yeah, that's okay. That's so that. the next steps are we want to do more interviews. So if there's anybody in this room who fits profile, you worked for not limited, come talk to me. <coughs> Give you all the information to get started and talk to your friends. Um, Damien? Uh, I've got a bunch of pictures here. I'll run through quickly but from the collection that Eric Kimball had. Uh, this was a display from the 100th anniversary of Oneida Community in the 1948. <coughs> it was a big celebration. And this was impressive. This is this all the, the CAC activities, which uh, just that was really an incredibly unique part. This is a uh, the original Lewis Point. Lewis Point was bought by the company in 1938, and then uh, rebuilt, but. Again, the cottages. I forgot how many there were, 23, something like that. And there are stories about those too, which uh, <laughs> we're not going to tell here. <laughs> this is the original bowling alley, which was in the back. Yeah. Uh, Matt Roberts said he has a picture of this in his office, and he, he could tell the building that it was in. But I don't know. The, uh, the CAC activities were moved from the factory to the barn in uh, 1918 and 19 uh, because PB Noise was concerned about the movies that were being shown in the basement uh, and the fire hazard that created. So that was part of the reason for the move. This, uh, speaking of innovation, uh, somebody, Kathy, Tom pointed out that you can't buy machines off the shelf to, to make the silverware. Uh, stainless steel, as Don can tell us, is a little uh, tricky because it's more brittle than, than uh, the materials used for sterling. Uh, and Don, you know what machine this is? That's what they would call a, a two stand rolling mill. And your dad is on the left. Yeah. <laughs> Reader rocher. Take that over stand in the back with an eye. Yep. And I'd have to get closer look for the rest of the movie. Yeah. But they were really proud of the uh, machines that they put together. Well, maybe it's appropriate here because I mean, we talked about I saw all over this morning. <clears throat> Somehow that's where this came up. But an Idle Limited, they patented all their copyrighted, whatever the right term is for flatware patterns. Mm -hmm. They didn't do a stitch in, in the factory. Yeah. They, and they had, um, I won't use his name here because everybody knows that he's dead anyway. But <laughs> um, he, he came up with some innovation and he wanted it patented. And he wouldn't do it. Yeah. Oh. Because it becomes public knowledge, and we didn't want that to get out of the day. Interesting. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I asked my father if he had any patents, and he had one. He, he was actually hired in 1947 to come in and uh, help design machines to uh, make stainless. So that's how that's how I got here. I was not born with an Oneida spoon in my. <laughs> <laughs> It was a wall of spoons. <laughs> but four months later, I was switched to an item. So I'll just run through these quick. These are some pictures that uh, I sent this picture to Jeff Prada. 
uh, he was kind of interested in this and wondered who the other people were. So I worked with Don to figure out who those people were. Yeah. Right? Is that Dr. Crowder? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
brings back memories looking at these pictures. This is, again, the late 50s, judging from the cars. One of the band concerts in the, on the park. And you said they were on Tuesdays? The concerts and don't we continue that tradition in Cheryl? Yeah. <laughs> that was Noise Park. Noise Park. The yeah. original band stand there. Right. Yeah. Where the ballpark is now. Yep. Great. Parties at uh, Lewis Point. Foreman's Clam Bake apparently was quite a it was quite a scene. As long as the clans were good. Yeah. <laughs> they were good. I didn't get invited to that party. I was just about to look sad until I found out what happened. Oh, <laughs> I did. It was awesome. Yeah. Funny, though, now, looking back. It's retirees. Yeah, this is retirees' party at the mansion house with uh, Don here and Matt. Oh, yeah, that's good with the day. Yeah. yeah. They look a lot younger. There were lots of pictures of, of retirees, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. You know, they, one of the things that the company did, which most companies I don't think do, is there were lots of celebrations. And at those celebrations like this one, management was there too. I mean, Pete Noyes is in there someplace. Mm -hmm. Bill Matthews. Bill, Bill? Yeah. 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 This uh, this got my interest. What a silversmith looks for in another silversmith sterling. It's one of the advertisements. Mm -hmm. Don, did you do that one? Mm -hmm. No. No. But you know the pattern. I'm trying to remember the top pattern. I think it's in Brazil. And then. <clears throat> Bunch of forts. And that table setting. And that table setting, the kind of thing that Melinda Noyes, <coughs> Melinda Noyes Cross, who just passed oh. away, that's what she would do. She would ready the table settings for the photography. Yeah. 